So it's working at the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I am actually en route down a very narrow country lane. I'm going to be stopping off on a beach in Somerset. I'm due to meet the guys, Craig uh, Butler, maybe somebody else is going to come out as well this evening, but it's not till this evening. High tide is, I think, around five o'clock. So I'm going to be going down here, down the country lane, and uh, I have the head cam on. So here are my hands, they're on the steering wheel. For all the winders that say, oh, you got, you're filming. Yeah, I've got a head cam on. I don't think there's a law against wearing a head cam. I don't know, maybe there is. But beautiful Somerset countryside, and I'm just gonna take a gamble and try and squeeze two or three hours out of a low water mark down here. It's a boulder strewn place. I fished there once, I think I might have done a film here once before trying to fish, I'm not sure but it is um, on the Bristol Channel. It's further up the Bristol Channel. I'm going that way and I've, I've got to come past it this way. So I figured I'm going to stop off here and try and get two to three hours in because this is a low water mark and where we're fishing tonight is a high water mark. Little village down here. Nice church up the top there. I don't know if you guys are seeing this or not. It's a bit windy. It's about two miles down here is quite a long way. I always find that when you're going uh, in a car down lanes, you think two miles, that seems to go on forever. Now this morning, guys, it was minus six. They gave us minus six. When I left, it was minus four. It's now gone up to plus four, so it's still very cold. The downside is the fishing has been wonderful, according to Craig, and the minute I want to come down with the cameras, yes, right, it's fallen off a cliff there. I think Craig was out yesterday and struggled. So I'm going to give this one a go. We're going to fish a high water mark tonight, hopefully, and I'm going to give three hours on this low water mark. Um, hopefully, about midday, I think it's low. I might have to wait for it to go down. So there you go. That's what the target is for today. Beach fishing, target species, anything I can catch. Well, people, I'm down on the beach. Met some metal detectors, and they were telling me up here is an old uh, harbour, apparently, an old harbour wall. It used to be a little village and a big huge wave took the lot out apparently so they've gone down there metal detecting I could do some fish detecting it is freezing I'm gonna pick most of my fingers up on the way back it's so cold I've got one rod out here and I'll just show you the beach look over there all the locals know that's Hinkley Point power station I remember doing an article over there with a guy he caught I think it was an eight pound twelve bass right underneath uh, the end of that gantry thing there on huge king ragworm. The ragworm over there are monstrous. Apparently they're, I don't know whether it's radioactive or what it is, but something makes them big. This is a mass of boulders here. It's horrible to walk over. So I've kept, and it's a big tide, okay, it's a spring tide. When I got here, it was touching the rocks there. Now it's dropped out in the 15 minutes it's taken me to get that rod out. So I'm gonna give it a go here. The time is 11.30. It's got another half an hour to go down for slack water and then it's gonna come in at some pace so i probably just fish big baits what i've got on here let me show you what i've got on i'm using two fixed ball reels one's out there it's a 2600 rod this is a 2400 rod both conoflex both probably not being out to buy them now i've got some squid there but it's fresh well it's fresh squid it's frozen obviously but i've left all the ink in it i think they call it dirty squid i think that's what they call it dirty and it is as you can see, it gets everywhere. Now, some people swear by this as bait, um, but I do wonder, I do wonder, because don't forget that black ink is a defense of the squid against their predators. So I know that it's a big cloud and they can't see the squid to grab it, but also is there a smell that puts them out? I don't know. We shall find out. I'm trying it. Look, enough anglers are caught on dirty squid that it does work. Panel hook wig there, pulley panel. One hook at the bottom, one at the top, elasticated together. Then I'm gonna be able to show you this much easier with two people doing it you might be able to see it there it's swinging I've got a light grip lead there because I don't need distance because the tide's going to come back in in a minute well half an hour I'm going to clip it like that can you see how that little clip works there that's the main thing see how that clip works and then that will release and hopefully hopefully he says the bait will lay on the seabed right this is the worst bit <clears throat> now when you get these big tide areas, don't go right down where I can have too much at low tide because you're only going to have to come all the way back again. And remember, this is a big area. Just remember where you put your gear. 
let's get this one out there in fact I think Graham it's easier if you walk on the sand mate good thinking do not get your boots wet in these sort of temperatures because it's not good I'm going to heave ho this one out hopefully it's not going to go a million miles and it's going to be shallow out there but you never know there could be That's gone out far enough, very, very shallow. But the benefit will be I can do a walk back technique when it starts to come in. I won't cast so often. Because then I can walk it back and keep it in deep water. Back that drag off, put it in the holder. Just check I'm tight there. I am indeed. I can do no more folks, except now just wander the coastline with my gloves on trying to get my hands well there's nothing worse than getting your fingers wet before you start with fishing look there's really not much choice is there and will be cold tonight so if I don't catch today or well, in this little three hour session hopefully when I meet the lads tonight the darkness coupled with a high tide might do it but I'm just down here I'm driving past this spot I might as well throw a bait out I've got three hours to kill it's better to kill it with a bait in the water just walked across here this is why it's always worth looking at low water because you can see there's a lovely big sandy area here so if you targeted up there and you were accurately recasting you could hit this from high water with a long cast probably 110 120 but if you cast there 110 120 you would be in the snags and lose your gear so there you are looking at low tide does give you a lot of an insight into what a beach looks like and where the features the fish holding areas might be that guy, is he following me? Woo! There's a man up on there walking his dog. He thinks, what is that man waving to himself for? I've got a camera on my head. Also, the water will fall out of these bays, but if you fish on the promontories, the little bits that stick out like I am, you'll get that little bit extra deep water for a little bit longer. All little tips that could, uh, could help you catch that odd fish anything there we go there we go there we go no fish but <laughs> success I'm very very lucky to see that one guys and where is that right in front of the car park well that's a bonus now I can afford to almost lose one I shouldn't say that because I probably will generally you find these with a piece of leader attached to it but that can be washed up and used again no problem What's that down there? Let's put that in my pocket. I do not want to lose. I was lucky to see that with a piece of wire sticking up. Is that a bomb? Oh, it's a power line to Wales! Sad, isn't it, really? Oh, I can amuse myself very simply. Well, that was a bonus. I'd like to find another one. I figure 80 yards from the closest point up there. And as the tide pushes you back, you see you can't reach the sand. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, I can't find it. I'm so happy. There's no lead to it, mine. There's the line. There's the hook. Look at this, how that guy's hooks. A panel rig is hooked in there. All it would do, did was hanging on the hook. Please let there be a lead on here. There is indeed a lead. Do you know what? It's the same lead. I reckon it's the same guy. A vein to try and lose it. And here's all the rubbish line you see because anglers generally generally anglers won't walk very far they want to get out of the car walk to the beach cast out well that's not always the best place is it and if they don't know the area then of course they're going to lose gear i'm not saying i know the area i just know that's a good spot for finding bits like this not big leads not those nice big expensive leads that's what i'd like to see but still two up boys two up and probably get a, a fish going to drag my rods in. Actually, I can watch both of them and I can run straight across from here. Wow, two. This is sort of interesting. I want to kneel down in the water like some sort of... some sort of oyster, very pretty shell. Now, if you want to, want to know when the tide's coming in, obviously if you haven't got a timetable, you're a bit stuffed. If you give me a good idea, especially a fast tide, get a big roller. Now I'm pretty sure, look, the tide was up at 12, that's 12.15. I'm just going to put this big boulder here. 
it's not come up that far. If I put it there, when that gets covered, I know I've got to start moving my gear back. Plus, I want to get one more good cast in here while I can walk right down the bottom here, get the maximum distance I can, and then do a walk back. I need to check the bait first. Time to wheel it in. I've done my, uh, my bit towards clearing the beach of leads. It lets me get my snag as well. Nope, I'm off. Main thing is get it coming in nice and fast. Up off the bottom so it doesn't get snagged. I'm hoping that the squid should, should still be in, in place here. You cannot afford to stop winding in rough gear. That bait is absolutely untouched and fine. I'm going to clip it up and send it out again. Now I can't get to it again. Hopefully you see it. There's a stone. And in 10 minutes, that's already, oopsie, that's already going to be underwater. That's how fast it comes in here on a spring tide. And it's going to fill all this bay up. So I'm working my way back up here. And then I can work my way. I'm always hitting the sand. I'm going to leave it and have a big walk back. Probably an hour at least. So it fills up because I'm on sand out there. Well guys, <laughs> I've only walked up here looking for some more leads. The tide is flying in. I've moved my gear up here. Not only is my stone gone, it's nearly on the tripods already and here it's touching the beach. That's in minutes. I've got to get moving. I'm not going to get cut off. I'm in a safe area, but this shows you how you can get cut off and how easy it is to get caught by the tides. You need local knowledge. Take no gambles because there's only one winner. It's going to be the sea. I'm still looking for legs, mine. All right, let's get these rods out of the way. Now this is a big area for fossils. I don't know if you're going to see that in the shade there. There's an impression of a leaf. I believe that is a leaf in there. Hopefully you can see it. Maybe if I... Oh! Ah, oh, there you go. Looks, to me that looks like the shape of a leaf. It's a very, very big area for fossils all around here. I've had a good old look around. I can't afford to look too much because the tide it is coming in big time. I'm almost constantly moving my gear back all the time now. I'm going to give it till about one, well, about 1.30, so they've been out an hour on the walk back technique. I don't want to walk back too far because otherwise I'm going to walk them into there because I cast out off that point and when I retrieve them I'm going to retrieve across here. So I'll have to recast for the last hour over there straight out uh, on the sand there. Once, once it pushes me too far up then I won't reach the sand and then my leads will be joining the other leads that I've been picking up there. So I want to leave before that happens. And also I've got to meet the other guys tonight. It'd be nice just to pick one fish up. But listen, Craig told me the fishing was dire. It appears it is dire, but I'm on, you know, fairly large bait. But you've got to be in it to win it, guys. And I'm out here on a fine English winter's day. Now there's another one just there. Maybe you can see that, see, uh, clean off the sort of shape of a fan there. Probably some sort of fern, I would imagine. And of course, they're rounded boulders where they're bundled up and down by the storms and the tides, so a lot of these get worn off. It's quite unusual really to find them. There's a lot here, but you've got to look for them. I'm going to look for some fish, I know that. It's on a bite, guys. It's like 180 yards out. I was just about to wind in. I looked up and had a bit of a slack liner. Who gave me slack line? I just do not want to lose it. This is my one shot deal, boys. This is why I've come here. The one fish wonder. Maybe. I've got to get it over the rocks. Come on, baby. It's kicking now, it's kicking now, it's kicking now. I'm about 100 yards out. Oh, no, don't get snagged. Don't get, I can feel the lead bumping. Oh. Oh no, he's snagging. He's snagging. Come out of it. Oh, I've lost. <laughs> you f***ing <laughs> fish. F*** it. F*** it. F***ing good fish. F***ing gone. Let's do it. For f***ing sake. F*** it. I ain't happy, boys. I really am not happy. That was a really good fish. I think, I think, or oh, it's banging, head shaking. 
It might have been a cod because I'm on a big piece of squid. I have a feeling it was a decent bass. So I'm really, the word is pissed. God. Anyway, you guys can see that that walk back technique with the big weight works after a fashion. Oh, I so nearly had it in. I just felt him bang, banging and bumping in something in the bottom. I had him coming all the time. I was terrified to push him, pull him harder because I didn't want to straighten the hook or, or rip him off. But just, it's a way, it's nothing bust, nothing bust. He just, maybe the leg snagged, snagged in the bottom and then he pulled off from that. But I'll give it a bit longer, but I don't hold, hold out much hope. I think that was my chance. Anyway, it's the way it is. Move this gear back, as you can see. The tide is encroaching by the minute. Well, I'm still smarting from losing that fish. Through no fault of my own, I hasten to add. But it's getting on now, it's just gone 2.30. I'm on my second walk back technique. So I'm cast out into the middle of the bay and I know the sand's clear there. If I make a second cast, I might fall short and go in the boulders and lose my gear. So I'm taking a gamble. I'm gonna give the last hour walking back, walking back, walking back. I know the leads are on the sand, but I've got to speed wind them in to get them up and over all these boulders. Because don't forget, it's very tempting because the water's just there as you move back to keep thinking, I'll just have another cast, I'll just have another cast. Sooner or later, you're gonna lose everything. I'd just love to see another slack liner up there, but I fear I've had my chance and it's gone. Not unpleasant here though. I think the bed's a bit lumpy. Right, well people, nothing on that last winding that took. That was two hours out there, absolutely two hours bait soaking. One bait was chewed, so I'm back. So plan A wasn't exactly a raging success, although I did enjoy it. Plan B is up here. I've come up the road a bit to St. Aldry's Holiday Park, all right? Been here before, stayed in caravans up there, but they got, I'm gonna call them, just so Mike knows on bushcraft, antique log cabins. Actually wood chalets, okay, but the view, there's the beach, let me show you. Just walk up here a little bit. I'm doing this quickly because I've got to meet Craig in about half an hour. There's a beach, I aim to fish that, hopefully tomorrow night in the dark. I'm working all the high tides out, low tides. So let's check this place out. It's quite exciting really. I think I stayed in one once before many times. Now it's going to be cold, it's the middle of winter. Ah, I've got a lovely little balcony, I bet this is a sun trap. Better make sure I've got the right one. Oh, is it 31? 31, thank goodness for that. Don't want to go in on some, someone was having a shower or something. Now these are for, they use, I just, I just talked to the owner James, so tea making, oh they've got a TV, oh my goodness me, there's, there's no cooking in these, but they've got a restaurant up, up the top with a bar. Oh, bunk beds, oh I can bring, I can bring all the, all the guys fishing can come back here, spare room, this is a family one apparently, look. I don't know what you're going to get, get of this, guys. Oh, what? Somebody's got the blower on. I haven't put that on, James, honestly. <laughs> yeah, very, very nice. That's me. Hello. Loser. Couldn't catch a thing, could you? Hopefully tonight. Well, this is really cool. I'm going to switch that blower off there. This will take the chill off because this will get cold, but it's wood. I suppose it shouldn't be too bad. But look, boys, what a view. Oh my God. I'm gonna have a fast cup of tea here and then hit the street and I'm gonna see what Craig's up to. Craig is a shore guide down here and hopefully, let's hope they come up with some fish they should do. They're the locals.
There we go, dogfish first cast. Uh, just on a straight single sand eel. Sand eel's better, you think, Craig? Well, I just, it was just what I had to hand on the first cast, so I just, it was quick and easy to put on, so. Good time. Yeah, something, right. Something's on the bite. Well, on his savage easterly winds, it's biting cold. So, you know, can't knock it, really. I fished for eight hours yesterday without a bite. So, first cast, it sort of makes up for it slightly. That's good. Right, let's go back anyway. I'm going to bait up with a squid and herring uh, cocktail. Uh, this is how I like to do it. Take my sand eel, trim off the end there, trim it off just behind the gills. I'm going to use uh, this double baiting tool. See the nice bit of blood coming out of there. Get the sand eel. And run the, you feel the baiting tool go down the backbone of the sand eel. Just sit him just like that. Got a bit of fresh minded herring um, here. It's all taking the fillet off. I'm going to cut a strip, similar length to the sand eel, and similar thickness of the sand eel. Like that with a pair of scissors. Just fit it eye over size, just about there. Cut that off. And take the second prong and just under the skin run the baiting pin underneath the skin of the herring like so and slide him down here then put the skin of the herring the skin of the herring alongside the sand eel like that so we can have the flesh on the outside take the elastic uh, this is the Tronix Pro uh, Baytex uh, latex um, elastic, very good. Just and it's on there. Right, take the rig. Got a two O Cox and Rule specimen hooks uh, set up as panel style. Just gonna put the hook in there between the baits just turn it round so it sits nicely between the baits put depress my thumb on the eye of the hook so it squashes the shank along level with the thing the bait and then just loads more elastic to elasticate that hook to the bait if we move this hook out of the way up here then hold the remainder of the, the, the hook length to the top of the bait there and then quite a few turns elastic, 20, 30, or whatever you feel you need. And there, just fin it off by snapping it off. This, this is so good, this stuff, you can just, just snap it off and it's, it's so stretchy, it just digs into the bait, leaving no scruffy ends. And just pull the pin out. And again, with this, uh, this hook, bring it down in there, turn it round, pull it up. There we go, got a nice squid and uh, sand eel and herring. Herring flesh there, the sand eel there. Plenty of blood coming out of there. Well, Craig's got a, a bite up here. We're going to go and see if we can uh, actually show you the bite. Stop bloody bouncing. Now. <laughs> Stop bouncing. <yeah. laughs> he will go again in a minute. He's, he's definitely on. Dog, I imagine, is it, Craig? Right. Probably a doggy, yeah. Yeah, I would say so.
It's on that rat bait there. Yeah, yeah it's just sand eel and herring. Greedy little white in. Nicely comes in it. Nothing massive, but welcome fish on a night like this anyway. And get more of those as, as, as the month, winter comes on. Yeah, yeah, it should do. They're just starting to come in the last couple of weeks. Grim out there, that looks grim. But what a view. What a view of a shocking English weather. Fog, easterly wind, freezing cold. I've, I've had a night's sleep of salts. You'll tell by the state of the bed. It will give you an idea. Now this campsite is closed. I was very lucky that they let me stay here very lucky because it's closed so they said look we'll unlock it it's going to be cold no one's <laughs> no one's been in there and it's the winter it's what i call a three duvet bed <laughs> i've got three duvets <laughs> i've had to pinch them from off the bunk beds i've taken them all off the kids bunk beds here and and they've got a nice bathroom as you can see lovely big bathroom but by golly and do you know what i think it is it's like a wood cabin, it's got insulation. I think it's this high apex, which you've got up here, because normally, if you had like a, a bed and breakfast room, as we call them here, or you have a hotel room, you have um, a flat roof, so it'd be coming across here. So it retains the heat. So I'm looking at it, laying in bed, thinking how cold I was. <laughs> all the heat is in the top, all the heat is up here, in that V. If I could. If I could stand on a chair and put a thermometer up there, I can assure you it'd be very, very toasty because there is a little radiator down there. Um, there's a blower in the bathroom. So I've, I've, the radiator's been on low, it's on a thermostat. I think the heat's up there because it looks nice and that's why they use these in the summer. So there you go, I'm going to have my breakfast. Oh yes, we haven't talked about last night, have we? Oh dear. It's a small chair, and the reason you might ask yourself, why are you sitting down there, Graham? Well, it's the only chair in the room, A, and B, the radiator's underneath the table, so the heat is coming out from underneath the radiator. This is as close to bushcraft camping as I get. If any of you watch Mike's TA Outdoors and follow him on that bushcraft camping, well, good luck to him. He was out last night, sorry, he was out as I was coming down. He was in Somerset, with I think Dustin, they gave six below. Horrible easterly wind. Now I know a lot of people, if you follow this bushcraft, it's weird really. There's people out there saying Canada and Alaska and all that. God damn, we get 60 below. And somebody else says, we get 70 below, we get 80 below. That's not winter. Yes, yes, yes. Now winter over here in England is totally different to winter over there. They get what's called a dry cold. We get a wet, damp, horrible cold. You can have an easterly out there, it might just be, I'm going to say, one degree below freezing, but with the easterly wind and the moisture it's carrying, listen, all you beach guys out there are nodding their head, they're nodding their head in agreement, it bites through to the bone, it drains you down, more so when you don't get any fish. So trust me, it's, it's cold and it's a damp cold, it's horrible. We are living it over here in the UK, we are in a temperate climate. Just so everybody knows that over there in Alaska and Canada and all those sort of places, it's a different type of temperature. We have a temperate climate. We're on the same latitude as, let's say, Nova Scotia, because they are dry on the land, 
they don't get the influence of the Gulf Stream. So the cold air comes freezing down the polar weather. They get all the dry, the dry cold air with the snow and stuff. It comes across the Gulf Stream, turns into the North Atlantic Drift. It obviously dissipates some of that cold and it comes as moisture laden air particles. It's still horribly cold. It's yucky and mucky. So, how did last night go? Let me get some of this down my neck and I'll tell you. Mm. Bushcraft camping inside. Ah, oh, you can't beat an English cup of tea, especially when it's cold. Come on, radiator. Last night, <clears throat> we fished what we call the town beach. We had a change of plan. We were going to go miles down the coast to another sort of open boulder beach where the fishing had been good but had died a death like it appears it has down here at the moment. The old saying is, when the wind is in the east, the fishes bite the least. How true? How true is that? But I'm going to try and break that mould. Last night we fished there for about three hours. It was allegedly paved with congreels and dogfish. I blanked again and Charlie had, I think, three dogfish. Did he have whiting? Craig had a couple of three dogfish, whiting, but very small dogfish. I don't think I've seen them so small. I don't know where it is. But interestingly enough, and Craig has given me some, they've been netting herrings, old school, like a hundred years ago, down in the bay there, in Minehead. They do this every year, and they only last about two or three weeks when they net these herring. Very, very fresh. They came straight out. We put them on the bay. I caught nothing on them, but Nice to have fresh silver bait. Craig has given me uh, two or three to try today. I feel they'll be better off the boat than they would off the shore because herring is quite a soft bait, uh, you know, especially if it's been frozen and unfrozen. These are fresh. <clears throat> you might give me a few frozen ones. Now, is it just the east wind that's stopping these fish biting or is it the fact that there's so many herring around that the fish are feeding on them? I don't know. I really don't know. Apparently these herring come in here to spawn for about two or three weeks. Well, if they're laying their eggs everywhere, maybe the fish are feeding on those eggs. I don't know, it's just a theory. You guys out there, what do you think? Or do you think this easterly wind makes uh, more of a difference on the fish? Or the fact down in this area in the Somerset where they you know, get these minehead uh, herring, is that what it is? Is that what's you know, making the fishing a bit tough? A bit tough, a bit tough. Anyway, I'm going to reverse my thoughts of staying here on this site. I'm gonna check out from here because it was pretty cold last night. I was going to stay a second night and go home tomorrow morning because I've got like nearly three hours drive. And I was going to hit this beach tonight and see if there's a chance of salvaging something from it. But I'm not. I think I'm going to go with this easterly wind because they gave it going southeast. That's why I came. To be honest, to tell you the real story, it was giving southeast, which had been off the coast. Lovely. I have been comfortable because this wind slices through you like a knife. Doesn't matter how much clothing you've got on. So I'm going to go right down that coast down there. And there's a slight curve around a headland there. I feel I'm going to be just what we call off the wind, just off the wind. I'm going to fish the tide down to the bottom, which will enable me to see what I'm fishing over, and then fish it all the way up. I may stay there into the dark. I may pack up there and I may come back here and trust her two or three hours here in the dark. I'll see how it goes for bites down there. I think I'm going to fish one big bait, and I think I've got to put smaller baits on now to salvage something, because I've been fishing ka-chunking big baits and other than that, I think I want to call it a bass or a cod, that fish I lost. Did I tell you? Did I tell you about the fish I lost? Did I tell you about it? I was not happy, Bunny, I can assure you. I think it was a six, seven, eight pound bass. That's my honest opinion. Still, I'm going to get going. I've got a secret weapon for food. I've got quite a bit of kit to get down there. So let's get going. I'm going to drop into Craig, uh, just double check with the score and double check the bait situation, see what, uh, what he thinks. Let's get going. Well, I'm down on the... Uh... On the my head pier, I come down here and uh, I'm going to give it a go further down the coast. Apparently some other people going down as well, but I'm going to see with Craig, just check with him. Always check with Craig. He's down on the end of the pier and mine head. Well, he's not on the end of the pier, is he? He's at the base of the pier and uh, he's got a little kiosk there. You can get tea, you can get snacks and little snacks and stuff, sweets and stuff like that. But more important, as well as the bait and the tackle, you can get the information. Well, let's see what he has to say and what his suggestions on the bait is going to be. After last night, um, getting blown about in that freezing wind, uh, in that direction, bitter easterly, it's probably best move down further down channel a little bit. 
uh, to a mark where you're going to get a little bit more shelter um, from the from the easterly wind. Uh, so basically, for bait wise, um, go for a packet of sand eels, uh, quality Devon bait sand eels, absolutely fantastic. Um, fish those whole, Craig, or you can fish, fish you can sections? fish them. You can fish them whole. You can fish them double. Um, a lot of people fit, like to fish as they're medium sized. Put two on instead of one. Yes. Uh, but obviously, when it's easterly winds, uh, fish. Don't gorge themselves stupid, so small baits generally work better. So I would suggest just using the one sand eel. I've been on big baits, uh, and I'm yeah. going to change today to like yeah, you guys definitely. did last night. On, yeah. yeah, on an east of these fish, their appetites seem to sort of stop. Yeah. So, but or very go small. Um, also, maybe a, a packet of mackerel. Again, Devon Bates mackerel, fantastic, brilliant, brilliant fresh mackerel. And lots I can make strips of those. Could I as well? Put yeah. Lots of strips of them. Yeah, strips, chunks. But I would, I would keep the baits slightly on the smaller side. Um, some herrings. These are fresh minded herrings. Um, I was. Which are which are available this time of year, uh, absolutely in peak condition, um, plump, full of roe, full of blood, and just at their perfect perfect time to use as bait, and absolutely deadly being a being a local local thing at the moment. So good off good off the boats <coughs> as well. Good, fantastic got... off the boats, fantastic for the spur dog, fantastic for the bullas, fantastic for congas, um, and it's a natural bait at the moment. You know, match the hatch. Now you you, you mentioned while we were talking last night that. Awful weather, you mentioned about getting spur dog off the shore. Yeah. So, I mean, is that a new thing? And what bait would you say for those? Well, spur dogs have been, been, been around for years and years in the Bristol Channel, <clears throat> but not this far, not as far up as Minehead. Uh, it's a relatively new species off the shore in the last sort of four or five years, um, where we'd usually get the odd one. Now the numbers are increasing, you know, so you can get multiple catches of them. Um, and what sort of size? What were they? Running? They're, they're running probably about eight, eight pound, well into double figures. Wow, big but fish! So, if you say sort of an average of ten pound would probably be about right. Further down the North Devon coast, they get you know the bigger specimens, you know, 12, 13, 14 pluses. Uh, but up uh, <coughs> up here, it's more the eight, to ten, eight to ten pound fish with the odd double chucked in. And bait for those? What, what's your favourite <coughs> bait? Whole, whole squid, um, he, squid head and guts, or turn, um, yep. to get a squid. You know, you can get the uh, the unwashed squid. Uh, it's fantastic. Fantastic bait. I generally like to turn the squid inside out. So yes, basically, yeah. all the guts and the juice and the scent is on the outside rather than stuck up on the inside out of the way. So that's true. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think in, in the past you've seen on other videos how I bait up yeah, a squid. Yeah, I like to cut yeah. it out, turn it inside out, give it a bit of a batting, a pounding, pounding, yeah. just just to release, tenderizing. Just ten, tenderizing that's the word. <clears throat> just to, to release the oils, and and that just seems to work. It just seems to work. Enhance the bait. The bait okay. doesn't look as great, but it, it does enhance the bait. There's also a few coddling around uh, where you're going, um, and obviously fresh lugworm is uh, obviously the key to the coddling baits this time of year. Uh, probably not the, 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 the key bait for the big cod, um, but for the coddling, we the general run of the mill, sort of one to three pound cod we're used to in the scene in the channel, lugworm is king of baits. Now, would you fish those singly, or would you no, fish I'd, them as a combo? I'd, I'd fish them singly, um, quite often, maybe the, these are only, they're not, not the biggest worms, but I personally, I prefer to put half a dozen of those on, rather than two big worms. You can you can get big lug worms here and there, but I, I think half a dozen small worms fish a lot better and more consistently than two two single big ones. Okay, okay. Also, ragworm as well, uh, another key bait in the winter. Uh, lots of juice, lots of blood, um, and lots of species eat that. Obviously, these these we get these in a couple of times a week. Big ones too. Um, yeah, they're, well, they're not the biggest, but they're they're okay. You know, they're, they're wild rag. Um, dug, they're, not, they're not the farm dug, ones. Yeah. No, not the farm ones. Wild dug, wild dug in this on the south coast. Uh, you know they're fantastic bait. Uh, the farm ones they tell me are a bit soft. Is that farm right? ones are okay? They serve a purpose. Um, they, they fill a gap when the natural supplies are really up against it. Um, but the, the, you know they, they do work, but they, they don't keep as well. Where you where we could keep these, you could take these home, keep them for a week, ten days, two weeks at home. The farm stuff, you're lucky if you get. A, Several days out of them, really. Oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah, so, if, you if, they if they're not sold quick, then they deteriorate quite quick. So, uh, people all around the world watch us on YouTube, as you know, it goes worldwide. So, just tell them they're going to say, Why is he putting in a fridge? Obviously, this is imperative that they're kept in the fridge. Um, we keep them in the fridge, and it's imperative that when you, when you take them from the tackle shop and you're going to keep them for a few days, it's imperative that you keep them in the fridge. Uh, lugworm to keep in a tray with a little water and change that water regularly. This is seawater, not fresh. Seawater, it's got to be seawater, but always when you're changing the water on them, give them a little drink of it, but make sure that water is the same temperature as the worms in the fridge. So don't be taking seawater straight out of the fridge and washing your worms in them because this, the temperature change will shock them and that will sort of like knock them, down, knock them back a bit. Okay, the ragworm, are they kept in what, vermiculite or something? Ragworm, you get. 
ragworm. Because you we, change it, your paper. Yeah, about, so rag, you know that if you have a dead one in the packet, it will kill the others, yeah, as it were. So. It, yeah. Ragworm comes in like a in a sea peat, um, which is obviously the diggers obviously get this off the shore and it's kept in in the sea peat, which is fantastic. We line a plastic tray with paper, and we, and we keep a sheet of paper over the top of them. We've probably changed this paper every day. As soon as that paper gets damp and wet, we change the paper, um, just to keep it keep it in the fridge. But obviously, we don't like to keep them too long in the fridge. We like to let them go to customers. But if a customer is going to take them home, store them for a few days, we recommend they keep them in a nice tray. Don't keep them in masses. Keep like half a pound bundles in your fridge. Um, wrapped up in a piece of paper and change the paper as soon as you notice it's going damp. Uh, my top tip for keeping your lugworm at home, um, if you're going to keep it for any length of time, is, uh, is seawater. Go down the beach, fill up a milk bottle, seawater, stick it in the fridge, keep it at the fridge temperature where you're keeping the worms, and basically when you're changing the water, flushing them, that water is the same temperature as the worms and you won't shock them. During the depths of winter, uh, sometimes it's tricky to get hold of um, fresh, fresh live ragworm and lugworm. And obviously, if you're going out codding and you can't get your fresh lugworm, there is a very good alternative. It comes in the form of a black lug. Um, these can be pumped um, in various places around the country. As a tackle shop, we buy these already in, already frozen, in wraps of ten, uh, which are pumped, gutted, and frozen. But obviously in, in the winter, when you can't get home, it's always worth having a two or three rolls, maybe more, in your freezer for emergencies. Nothing worse than getting home from work, weather's perfect, and you've got no worm, tackle shop shut, you've got a few of these in the fridge at home, or in the freezer, sorry, and away you go. And they're, and they're, they're a fantastic bait. I've had many, many cod, most of my double figure cod, and the better quality cod I've had in the channel over the last several years, have all been on, on a whole squid with one of these worms. Like and the, just so the people around the world know, they're not ordinary lug, right? we just showed you the lug, yeah. ones. these are black lug. <coughs> yeah, these, these are different these, these species. Are yeah? Different species, it's a black lug, really tough skin, um, and they, they, they withstand the freezing. Normal blow lug won't freeze. Well, let's say it will, you, you could freeze them on a hook length and freeze oh, them yeah. down and cast them out, but that's a lot of flapping around and a lot of hard work, which, which you know, to save chucking them away, that's a good option to do. Um, but the frozen black lug, perfect. It's practical, you can stick it in your freezer, it will last all winter. Well people, I am down here on the most gargantuan beach you could want to fish from. Impressive scenery and this has got not millions, billions of tonnes of shingle have been pushed up here. I'll show you down there. This is about low water now. It's about just before lunchtime, just after 12.30. It's low water, so it goes from there Follow my finger, there's a guy fishing down there in a the hot spot I guess, right up to the top of that shingle below those mountains. It's actually a cliff path that goes up to Castle up there. It's pretty cool, I bet some good views up there. This is monumental and the best thing about this is it looks like there's no giant ankle busting boulders for Uncle Graham. Two other guys have also just turned up down there. The wind is slightly off this mountain. There you see the mountain with all the mist and the rain's been coming off, I've got to get some baits out. I'm going to whiz down, get two baits out. I'm trying to really, really light one. I've already got one out there. I fired out, to, fired out a big bait there. Couldn't help it. I know Craig said use small baits. I just want a big fish. Um, I'm going to chuck the spinner out today. I haven't bothered the last couple of sessions, but I will throw the spinner out. I've bent a ring there by the look of it. And um, fingers crossed we eventually get to catch a fish.
up here where the tide will come it looks like the first sort of see the ridges here maybe that's high water those guys are on it down there right down the point there I haven't moved up there because I'm going to get pushed up there if I do decide to stay on until high which is probably about six o'clock tonight be in the dark I bought wait for this guys a bit of food with me so I've got to put a little cooker up there and I'm going to pinch some of that all oh, stuff these people have somebody's obviously built something here loads of bits of wood there's been a fire there at some stage and here because I've got to get out of the wind somebody's made a little seating area play area the only trouble is there's a bit of wind coming up over the top of this bank I might pinch some of these or make a little uh, wind break down there that is some spectacular view is it not of an enormous beach and you know what I hope there's a fish on it with my name on it and I hope there's no lost gear weed could be the other problem Going to get a good half an hour. A few white caps I saw way in the distance, so hopefully the wind's not going to come up. It's a question of come on, you fish. But guys, I've got the I think I've got the lead out. I don't think there's anything on the end. But at least I've got my uh, gear back. It's getting hammering bites on. I don't understand why it's getting snagged up there. Let me saying I was getting uh, oh no, something on there. Oh, save the blank. A humongous, giant, monstrous knot. I'll tell you what, guys. Never has a fish been so greatly appreciated. A conger eel. My God, that sky's black. I'll probably get struck with a bolt of lightning now. Great. Let's get this guy off the hook. I was lucky to get that one out, to be honest. Wow. Mr. Conger, you are gratefully received. Only small. They come in different grades. They come in conger eels, which I would consider double figures and above. They come in uh, straps, sort of five to ten pounds. And they come into like two, three footers like this, which we call bootlace eels. And we'll put Mr. Conger eel back. That shows us some life down here anyway. That's one thing. Nice just to get something, people. I think I'm due, I think I was due, but a hell of a bite. But what he hung up in, I do not know. Maybe he had his tail wrapped around a boulder. Let's give him a good throw out so that he doesn't get washed back by the waves. Oh! There he goes, you see him swimming. Gone. Baits out, baits out. Now I'm all renewed enthusiasm. 67 year old man seen running, sprinting up a beach. Believed to be on amphetamines, the speed he was travelling at. More like a cup of cocoa. I brought my bait down here now. Bait up down here, get it out. Right, now that one was on. I'm trying to shield this microphone. Let's snip the tail off as Craig does. Mind you, my casting probably going to spin anyway. I'll go in through there. And wind is a shock. It will not lay down. I've got to bring it right up the shank. It's just my way of doing it. Everybody's different. I don't have one of those baiting tools. Must admit, are handy. I use knives, but I've seen Craig using scissors for his bait a lot, and that makes a lot of sense. So you can get it exactly the size you want. Going very slightly smaller than last time. Mind you, you want to cut your nails with those scissors. I'm going to bring the hook down here. This is a second. My only concern is I've used. A finer wire hook for my top hold bait holder, if you like. Slightly finer wire, so if I get a hook hold on that one, I may be in trouble. Then I'm going to lay the bait, nick it there, so it's through once. And then using my magic thread. Where would we be without magic thread? Don't even know what it's called, bait thread. 
that wind is a nightmare. I'm going to start whipping that on. I believe that is the the tip. A compact bait. Mind, I'm not going huge distances. Probably, I've got a bit of a following wind, so I'm probably getting, I don't know, 80 yards of bait if I'm lucky. Big difference between going out in the field throwing lead 140 yards with no bait to wind behind you in a flat field and coming down on a windswept beach with a big wind drag bait. So you can see that. That's a bit of a wrap. Let's get it out there. I'm going to take the camera off, guys. I'm amazed that small water hasn't gone. It'd be nice to get something different, wouldn't it? Right, once more into the breach, dear friends. I think the tide must be flooding now. So I'm going to get this one slightly pulling right. A bit tricky when you're casting and filming with a camera on your head at the same time. So this one's only going to get a bit of a lump out there. A bit low. It'll do, hopefully. Yeah, I think the tide's pulling well that way now. All right, let's walk this one back up. It's nearly time for lunch. There's something interesting here, people, look. Wow. Look at all this line somebody's lost. So, where, I, although I don't know where I'm fishing, it's telling me two things. Someone's fished here before me, and B, if you leave your line out there too long, it's going to get covered by the stones. Look at this. I reckon that's what happened to me earlier on. It's yellow line. The owner of the yellow line. You know where it is. Oh. Oh dear. It's a bit like those films where they're looking, putting that wire waiting for a bomb to explode. Oh, look how this has got buried. That's amazing. Oh, no lead on the end. Oh, that's not right got the line out of the way though because otherwise what happens people is when the line is like that you come in the spike off your grip blade or your hook catches in somebody else's line it only takes one strand slides down and then you break off and make even bigger snags you can't help breaking off look none of us can but if you get the chance to get it back get it out of the system get it out the way make life easy for yourself and all concerned I'll like to tie mine up in a knot and I like to burn it on my log burner. It's done then. I'm going to check that spinner. Well, the tide is pulling really hard on the flood to the right, so I'm going to go further to the left with my... Uh, I've got a two hook longer, longer flap of some squid bound on there. And I'm going to go up to the left because it's dragging to the right. The only problem is I've got, I have seen a bit of weeding on the hook and I'm getting some strange not the knock bite. Let me get this out. Oh. That's far enough. I'll get some strange pulling down. It's not the waves. I think it's weed running along the bottom. But I had a uh, half a sandal on the one of the small hooks. Um, changed from a three hook to a two hook. I don't want to get snagged. Thirty percent less chance of getting snagged. Thirty percent less chance of catching a fish. I suppose you could view it that way. When I was putting this bait on, on this one, it's quite interesting, I'll just show you briefly as an interlude. This is called my shotgun. Chuck my spinning rod out, which I just do for fun really, just to see what's out there with small hooks. Cutting up a squid that we caught down on Weymouth Pier for bait, and then inside it, I was cutting this one open, you can actually see there, that tube is like the ink sack. You can see it coming out. It's like a, a silver tube that's in there. It's actually silver there, but it's absolutely caked and, well, <laughs> caked in ink. And now, of course, yes, Graham, that was stupid. Now I'm caked in ink. I just thought that was interesting, that was all. Up there is a beautifully made fire pit ready to cook me something. Hello. I must have set that a bit loose. Or do I have a customer? No customers today. I have got the open sign up. 
but no customers have come other than that small conga. So I don't know whether you people will see this if I stand here. This is a spinner, now watch the tip go down. I've literally only just thrown it out, look it pulls right down, comes back up, there's no big waves there. I think it's weed. And then it'll pull down again, there look. There's no big waves, I just feel this weed building up on it. And that's what's causing it to seesaw in the current of the tide. The big rod on the left actually has, has got the same sort of movement to it. <coughs> the one on the right is very stiff flank, but that one hasn't got it. For sure it's not fish, you can see the movement. I just thought I'd point it out for beginners. A bite will be much sharper, or slack will be your slack line will pull the grip let out, give you slack line and you must wind down straight away and thump the hook in, otherwise you're going to have problems and miss the fish. Over there, I mean, it looks like Armageddon. I don't know if it's coming down off, off Exmoor or what it's doing, but by golly, that is, as the saying goes, that's as black as your hat. Hopefully it doesn't turn into the liquid stuff. What's coming my way? Plenty, plenty of cloud, but that's pretty black up there. Come on fish, give it some. Someone out there has got to be hungry, surely. Just had a hell of a whack on the spinner. Gave me a bit of slack line. Put my hat up. Ah. Get me hood up, hang on a second guys, I'm freezing. Definite whack, I don't know if there's a wind in and check it. Unless the grip there just jumped under the pressure. He hasn't come back and I thought I had a bite on here. I think I'm gonna check this one people. I think I'm just gonna check it. No, nah, there's nothing there, so I'm gonna leave him. That was a good bite. It'd be nice to get a different species, wouldn't it? Small codling, something like that. I haven't seen the other gentleman wind anything in yet. Way, way, way down there in the distance under the shelter of the cliff, he's got a lovely flat spot. But I wonder if the tide really rips there, because it's going to hit that headland, go out and around, and you can see it's a massive tide rip there. There's a hell of a lot of current up by that, uh, by that rocky outcrop where it comes down. In contrast, if it's ebbing, it's coming this way, the tide will hit the other side of the headland and it will kick the tide out there. Probably make a bit of an eddy here, not quite so bad. Crank it away here, guys. Seems a bit heavier. Reach out, I don't want to, don't want to stop winding. The thing is, with these beaches, you just cannot afford to stop winding because you're in the snag. I feel there might be a fish on here, people. I feel there might be a fish. Ooh. Oh, no, no, he's got me in. He's got me in. You son of a gun. Oh, he's off again. He's in again. Oh, give me a break. Just there. Please, really, really snapped off. It's the word. There's only one word. It begins with an F. It's I've had another speed wind on a second rod and got a dogfish. You can see how the how the ledge just grip grip all the time. Oh I'm exhausted. The spinning rod's about to come out the rest. There we go people, this is a dogfish on a half way, it's a mackerel tail that I've sent out there. Been out there a long time and there's so much tide running I may not even have known he was on there. Hopefully I can get him off without getting a hook in my fingers, I can. So one dogfish, one conger and one lost good fish, again, again. God, yeah. When it's fast cranking, it is hard on the arms and elbows. Out he goes. Now, how long this is going to stay alight for, I don't know. But I aim to get something decent cooking here, boys. If, yeah, that's going. I'm going to put my other bags up around here. 
The wind is blowing like 20 knots. So if I can try and get this built up a bit, make a bit of a windbreak, that should do it a little bit. I'm not going to die of starvation, I'm sorry. Call me old fashioned. I think that's going. I want to build my little wall here. It's sort of mildly effective. Hopefully, I've got enough gas. Anyway, there's a load more guys here. They are piling down like you wouldn't believe. They've got beach buddies, and this gentleman just come up to talk to me. He's, I told him it's ripping and I've only had dogfish, etc. But he said it's got pounded for spur dogs about 10 days ago. And there's all lots of line snags in here. And if you remember, I pulled that line up, didn't I? That was going crossway. So I reckon two lots of gear I've lost are pulled into other people's lines. Because they had that sort of juddery feel about them. One cost me a fish and the other cost me a rig and a lead. So not good. So I'm not too worried at the moment. The current is absolutely pouring to the right. My rods are pulled right round. I, could, I just, you know, figure I'll have something to eat first. And I reckon my only shot now is right on top of the tide when it eases a bit, so I'm going to tough it out. And I guess that's what these other guys are coming down for. They're all coming down for the spur dogs, which obviously pay the obviously aren't here at the moment. How hungry are you guys? I'm pretty hungry. I think we're talking four rashes hungry. Just hope the gas doesn't blow out. Fingers crossed. Do you know what? It's annoying. The wind comes up just when I'm going to cook. <laughs> it's all it's all it gets me for some reason. You know, you get these things at Christmas, and you think, why did somebody buy me that? And in fact, this one's quite handy. It jams into the handle of the knife, look, so it doesn't fall out, and you slide it. Then you get a knife and a fork, which seems to me a very handy implement. I wonder if this bacon is going to swirl all down the beach and have people turning up wanting bacon sarnies. If you saw the angle <laughs> those rods have got, <laughs> it's unbelievable the amount of tide that's starting to pull there now. They're nearly out the rest, so I've moved them back up. I'm hoping I can get this bacon and eggs done before... Uh, it's certainly going, and it's smoked bacon. I hope we get the bacon and eggs cooked uh, before I get dragged totally in the side here. And I'm hoping the gentleman next door doesn't, with this tide, get dragged into my lines because I don't need untangling with braid and yet more snags. I've got a small rod there, just bounced around like crazy. I don't think it's a fish. If it is, it'll have to get washed in. It's that middle shotgun rod. I think it's just the tide bouncing and banging on it. I could go and check on it, but then I'm missing the bacon, aren't I? I'll tell you what, Craig does a bit of guiding and he does a very fair turn on cooking sausages on the beach. And you guys go guiding, I'll go on those guiding trips with him. I'm not saying he always serves it, but it does really jolly the day up to have some hot food. In England, you can't have bacon without eggs. Now I've got these down the beach without breaking them is beyond me. Let's see if we can get one of these in. With a minimal amount of shell. Perfect, perfect. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, nearly. Good for calcium these as well, if you want to eat them. Entirely up to you. And I've broken the yolk, is that a bad luck sign? Mmm, it's good. I've got to be careful guys, I don't actually eat the microphone at the same time. Mmm, -hmm. that was well worth bringing out, for sure. A bit short on drink, I probably didn't bring enough, I've got a small flask. But not too many people who uh, take the trouble to take their own bacon and eggs. Should have done more bacon. Should have done more bacon.
I might have another cook up in a minute. I've lost net another set of gear, boys. But if he's still on down here, I don't know. He is indeed another fish. Now they've been getting bull husks down here. I'm going to turn this way for the microphone. This one looks dark like a bull husk, but in fact it's just a very, very dark doggy, very dark dogfish. He's unhooked. And you see, they're not huge doggies down here. Don't seem to be huge ones, but listen, it's still a fish. Two doggies and a conger eel, and it's not dark yet. Wow. This time I've got a bigger dogfish, guys, a little bit bigger. It's howling the wind, I don't know what you're going to get off of this. There we go. Yeah, it's another dogfish. I'm probably only going to give it another round. I'm going to wait till the uh, top of the tide. And then I think I'll call it quits. Maybe half an hour down. But at least I've had three doggies. And I'll turn this off for you. In case you didn't see it the first time round. Nice dogfish. Going to get this guy back. I'll give it out another hour, hour and a half. And then I've had enough. Call it quits. But at least I've got some dogfish and a small eel. And I've had a pretty good time, really. Can't grumble. And there you go. Well, guys, uh, as I thought, Sammy the spinning rod has come up with a fish. And I've got one, uh, another dogfish, just when I thought it was all over. So there you go, another dogfish. That was caught just literally throwing it, well, 30, 40 yards, 30 yards. I'm trying to keep out of that tide. So it does show you, casting closely when it's dark, the fish will come in closer. So, hope yet, hope yet, the dogs are on the bite, or they appear to be anyway. Well, folks, you probably won't get anything here. It's about as bright as I can get my light here. I'm going to hit it with a... You can probably get any of this at all. I don't know, because this camera's not great in this low light. I've had hammering bites on that middle rod. I'm just getting to packing up time. I think he might have dropped it. A little bit of slack line, let's pull this out a little bit. Who put that in there? Just there, I can tighten up. It was absolutely hammering just now. I've got all my implements laid out down there. I've got a herring, I'm going to take that home because I figure that's better used in the boat. But, there's the bite, there's the bite. Okay guys, there is the bite. I think I'm going to crank this one and I'll feel he's there. I'm going to leave this one up here, if I can. That's full power on that. Probably won't get anything at all, I don't know. I've got my headlamp on here as well, so it's just a... Why did I see if we've got any fish on the end? Yes, I think we've got fish. If I can keep it coming, keep it coming, keep it coming. I hope he doesn't come off and quite small hooks. I've got sandy long, which they tell me is really, really good for getting doggies. I think there's a big dogfish competition coming up shortly. We should be in it down here in this beach. And this one I hurled out and I've got a chunk of squid on as well. So I'm not sure what you're getting here, if anything at all. I can't even adjust the camera, stop my head. Stop my head, stop my camera. I'm guessing you got something. Let's see if we got fish here. For sure, we got. F oh, yeah. Oh, what? Double whammy, people. That's the way to finish. And that's that turn of the tide that I was waiting for. Getting them now. Getting them two at a time there, people. There's a sand hill on the end. And this one was on squid. Let's get them unhooked and then, do you know what, I'm going to take the long walk back to the car. I must have had about a dozen, a dozen or more doggies. So no problem with the dogfish. That was worth staying on for 6.30. I think I will chuck these guys back. Well guys, the lines now are absolutely straight out in front. So, although high water was nearly an hour ago, 
that slack has just come now, so I might have to hang on a little bit. Not that I need much of an excuse, I've got a three hour drive home. I'm just adjusting these now. Now right, you're getting there. Seen to, it's got to pull to the left, it's got to pull. And then, if there's no fish, I'll go home. So on this one, I've got uh, two sand eels and squid combos. On this one, it's, um, I don't know, I think it's a herring head. And this one's a great big half a herring chunk with a bit of squid wrap around the outside of it. So I've got two big baits out there still, still. And ironically, a lot of the fish I'm catching is on the spinning rod in the middle there. I've normally got a big camera, but uh, I've not bothered with that. Hopefully there's enough power left in this one to see me home, because I've got quite a, a long walk back to the car. Yeah, it's gone a bit quiet on bites now. And this is when I thought we would get the bites, ironically. Well, there we go people, get my gloves off. I'm gonna call it quits now, definitely. I'm still catching dogfish, but look, this one's got some red line here, all around it, and this is the problem. This red line, well not the red line, just line generally, is, um, let's switch it off for you. It's what I've got the fish on, is my line, but the red line, it's been picked up on the way in. It's a nice one, but the problem being, I've picked up red line as well, that's not mine, so somebody's lost this as well. They've lost some, and that's what's causing me a bit of grief and other anglers, all this loft skier that's in the water. And there's not even, wait for this, there's not even a lead on the end of it. Just loose red line, somebody's shock leader. And that's how it finished. Plenty of dogfish biting at the last moment. The first trip I had, I lost that. Did I tell you, did I tell you about that fish that I lost? That was a big one, I'm telling you. Second one in the night was a bit of an epic, another blank, but third time lucky, I came good. So, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to watch Totally Awesome Outdoors, Totally Awesome Fishing Show. If you want to support us, there's a range of clothing on the website. Check it all out. We'll see you again on the next fishing film.